um, one of the other ones that like visually, like, I don't know, I'm, I'm very visual uh, when it comes to cannabis. Like I, I was always into purple and um, not right. necessarily because of the high or anything. It's just, I like the color purple a lot and I like to be yes. surrounded <laughs> by, you know, aesthetic beauty is the cool. Yeah. I don't know how do you pronounce the Kumoni. How do you pronounce that? Oh, Kumoni. Yeah. Kumoni. Kumoni. Yeah. What can you tell me about yeah. that line? I mean, that's what a striking picture on the site. Oh yeah. 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 Um, so, I mean, the, the one thing to bear in mind is like um, purple color, you know, is very common in cannabis. I think precisely for the reasons you're saying you like it. People just do like the color. Um, and it's really quite uh, typical to find populations that of one land race where like, you know, half of the population or whatever is purple, half sure. is green. Or so Kamani is definitely, and the same as with Highland Thai. So like Kamani definitely like, I don't know actually what, percentage it would be but i mean i'm sure it's controlled by some alleles or whatever yeah but of any, of any field of a typical kamani uh field there'll be like a you know a percentage of them will be purple plants uh sometimes that's temperature related um and uh, kamani okay so that's a very different type of plant from the highland thai so kamani is like a is a kamani is a multi-purpose himalayan land race that's for yeah. fiber and for culinary seed and uh hand rubbed for hash you know yeah um, it's not as not intended for producing since me there's there's no culture of that at all in in the in the himalayas in that area of the himalayas so um uh it it's going to again break down to type one, type two, type three chemotypes. I would expect if you actually looked at the fields, and so some plants um, will be useless for smoking as as bud, and then others you could begin a breeding project with to bring them up to being like strong type one if you actually wanted to. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think generally the males are what's primarily used for for fiber production. Um, like they'll these days, like most people don't actually in the village do the work of like retting the hemp and like turning it into yeah. um, cordage or whatever. But it used to be like a hundred plus years ago that um, most people in the Himalayas would wear clothes made out of hemp. They'd make shoes using hemp. They'd tether all their livestock using hemp um, cordage. So it was a really crucial plant for them at that point but again one of these sort of status social status considerations that comes into play around cannabis is that having clothes that were made from himalayan hemp was a marker of not being like a high class person in the himalayas you know oh interesting so, yeah yeah so typical you know kind of situation where you have the original community of the Himalayas that were doing all the, were using hemp as their primary textile plant. Then you had waves of immigration coming up from the plains of kind of Hindu, um, uh, Hindu um, Brahmins and stuff. And mm -hmm. um, then you have this kind of class distinction that gets made between people who wear cotton clothes and people who wear hemp clothes. And so even in Kamaun today, like, um, you know, there's a, if you look in the old 19th century stuff, there was a specific kind of Kamauni curse or, or, you know, like sort of a swearing type phrase that basically said, you know, like, I hope your, I hope hemp grows all around your house, basically, you know, <laughs> so, so it's sort of like basically, you know, that was, it was a marker of being a, of a, of a lower status group. So the Cass yeah. or Casavaria would be the people who, were associated with growing hemp and still do primarily do that. People would call them like Pahari or Pahadi or whatever. It would be the mountain um, local people who mostly grow it. And uh, I've seen friends of mine up there who are from the more kind of landowner aristocratic type communities who mm -hmm. I sometimes would like um, have like bags of seeds I collected whilst I was staying at their guest houses and stuff and we're just kind of you know be chucking them around the place and on the off chance they germinate and they'd always like make a point of like killing any of the, <laughs> of the seedlings because they just it wasn't even a legal thing it's just like they're too posh to have this growing yeah, around yeah. yeah it's like really you know it's <laughs> it's a nightmare but um 
uh, and yeah, so Kamani is like that type of plant essentially. Uh, I, I don't know to what extent there might be spiritual or kind of sacramental use associated with it, mm -hmm. but definitely if you go into some of the Shiva temples, you will see like people in Kamaun who will offer, you know, flowers of cannabis to, to Shiva and stuff along with Datura oh, wow. and these kind of things. So it's definitely a, a thing, but how old it is, I don't know, you know. Yeah. A lot of these areas would have been Buddhist if you went way back, you know. Yeah. before they were Hindu and, and some of them would have been kind of animists, like kind of worshipping sun gods and stuff, like possibly kind of Iranic, Scythian type connections. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, if you go into the temples in Kaman, like uh, you can see the sun gods often have like these uh, calf length kind of uh, riding boots, you know? Yeah. Uh, which you don't see on any other kind of deities in uh in, in the Hindu pantheon, but the solar gods who definitely have a connection to Iranic kind of Central Asian cultures uh, uh, that have these uh, riding boots, you know, which could be a connection to Scythian culture. Yeah, that's fascinating. I love, I love uh, learning about that specific culture, like Syrian, Sumerian, all that. Yeah, Scythian, Scythian sort of, um, Scythian like, uh, um, uh, you know, it's the one ancient culture where there's a very definite, undeniable hemp, oh, cannabis connection, you know, like obviously with Herodotus in, and the finds in the Pamirs and stuff of, yeah. of these, uh, and, and the Altai, which are all unequivocally Scythian, like archaeology in the, in the burials and stuff, uh, the materials and, um, uh that's all sort of 500 bc ish and there was a you know so it's like these are a kind of culture zone of the Scythians really like went all the way from the frontiers of china all the way to the frontiers of europe um so you know you've got the fine the the the, the documentation from herodotus at north of the black sea and what sort of ukraine and southern russia saying yeah. yeah these people are fumigating with cannabis that's kind of 450 bc then you've got the very very closely dated sort of 400 bc ish 450 bc ish finds in paziric and the altai that are scythian where they actually have the tripod type kit exactly as described by herodotus even though it's like thousands of kilometers east but it's wow. again scythian, scythian territory then you've got um that's in paziric and the altai and then just south from there a few thousand kilometers <laughs> you've got um the finds in the eastern pamirs just near xinjiang of the fumigation uh, devices, which again, definitely Scythian uh, based on the material in the burials, which are, have cannabis all over them. And then possibly you've got Stavropol as well in, which is Southern Russia, just north of the Caucasus, which again is Scythian where you've got like cannabis and opium on these uh, drinking vessels is probably what they are. Again, yeah. 400, 500 BC. So you've got four kind of finds which you can say, yeah, these are definitely Scythian and they're spread right across the Scythian culture zone in the Iron Age. And then during that period, to get it back to command, during that period, you had the expansion of the Achaemenid Empire, which was essentially a Scythian project, even though we call it Persian. Yeah. Uh, the expansion of the Achaemenid Empire right up into the Indus region of India and probably across there and they installed all these satraps like local governor governors who were Scythians and during that same period talking 500 BC you have this um finds of uh retting lakes suddenly becoming very active up in the in the uh Ganges uh, source river rivers up in Kamal and Garwal type area it's Garwal but it's the same bit of the Himalayas you yeah. suddenly have this massive increase in using of these lakes to rot uh, cannabis to make cordage or textiles using uh, cannabis fibers. So is it connected to the Achaemenid conquest? Who fucking knows, but it, it seems highly plausible. And certainly Indian botanists are inclined to think that it was Scythians who, or at least very, at very least Scythians were involved in the rise of cannabis to become a widely cultivated crop in 
in, in the Himalayas because it, it certainly correlates in terms of the dates when you start seeing it appearing. You know, in similarly in Nepal, it's the same kind of period when you find these uh, indications of people moving seeds around into the Kali Gandaki sort of area, which is the one of the main routes you would take to go from Central Asia through Tibet down into Nepal. You suddenly find these uh, fires with clear sort of what look like people eating seeds and stuff yeah around 400 bc ish so um yeah maybe the cool thing is all this is sort of speculation but there's going to be a whole bunch of genomics work coming out next year that should be sufficiently granular to start seeing how these populations fit together you know was it was was is, are there independent centers of domestication where you know was was cannabis domesticated in the himalayas independently or was it introduced as i suspect yeah. you know was it uh, so anyway you, um but yeah there's definitely like a plausible central asian i mean the himalayas in a cannabis perspective is central asia but yeah um it's plausibly kind of uh, quite closely tied to uh, northern, uh, more northern groups like Iranic kind of groups like the Syrians. That's fascinating. Yeah. Um, one one thing I, I I definitely want to ask you about is some of the Greek accessions you have. Um, oh yeah, yeah. yeah I'm yeah. not familiar with Greek cannabis at all. Um, I do have some in the freezer, but I haven't I haven't mm -hmm. ran any. Um, what can you tell me about some of those? Um, so Greece is another one. It's funny, kind of like because it it links into the, what we've been talking about with the Scythians in the sense that what I was thinking, um, yeah, they they documented the you know, Herodotus documented all that um, Scythian cannabis culture way way back. But in terms of what you have with uh, land races that you can find in Greece these days, or, or could find, um, mm -hmm. they're a much more recent phenomenon, I suspect. Although again, this is one of these things that you actually need genomics to really establish what their sure. ultimate origin is, but certainly the historical evidence from the 19th century is that there was a big introduction of seeds to Greece by uh, these kind of smuggling networks that operated out of Lebanon and Egypt and places and Turkey and so on who, um, when, um, uh, that's something like, uh, anyway, there, there were seeds were brought in to give to farmers who were taught how to grow and, you know, dry sieve hash and stuff in order to supply the market in Egypt. Because there was a huge, huge demand from Egypt, like the big centres of demand for for um, uh, for for cannabis drugs were um, northern India and uh, Egypt in terms of globally. You know, these were the huge because they had these huge cities like Alexandria and Cairo and sure. you know, uh, where there was massive urban centres where there was this big demand for for hash and things. And um, so there was a ban in, imposed on Egypt in in Egypt, which meant that the production shifted to Greece and they would just ship it across from Greece to drop it on the coast in, in what's yeah. now places like Libya and then just bring it in. And um, so the types of plants were basically the types of plants that the, were being cultivated in Lebanon and, and places in Egypt and so on. So that, you know, they would just bring the seed. It, all the evidence suggests that seeds were brought from places like that and to Egypt. And certainly the plants are very closely related they're like kind of like uh you know uh they're semi-dwarf mostly like uh you know so they sort of stay under two meters yeah somewhere between like sometimes you know some individuals can be like less than a meter even if you give them space and, <laughs> but, yeah. but uh you know not not more than two meters would be normal and um uh they're definitely the same broad group as what you'd find in Egypt, Lebanon, Syria, Turkey, Morocco. The thing to bear in mind is that like um, the sea was the main way to move stuff around, you know? Mm -hmm. So these things did move around by land, but as with um, when thinking about tropical sativas, you know, the Bay of Bengal was this huge sort of point at which this is all these genetics were swirling around. You know, people were importing uh, cannabis from Sumatra to, to India in the 
17th century. And similarly, people were moving hash around the, the, the Eastern Mediterranean a lot. And consequently, people who were involved in making money out of it were sometimes moving the seeds around, you know? Yeah. So it was definitely, it's very, very clear. There was an intentional introduction of, you know, um, Levantine or whatever land races to uh, Greece by these smuggling networks. And um, they're kind of like indicas, basically, in the sense that we would think of an indica, but they tend to be more narrowly footed and effect wise, they're more, um, that they don't have such a strong sedative tendency. And so some aficionados call them like compact sativas because the leaflets tend to be on the narrower side. Yeah. Um, and the effect tends to be more sort of typically tends to be more euphoric, but all of that, that said, you know, you can get very kind of funky indica smells out of things like Moliotico and stuff, which is one of the ones we've got. Um, and the other big thing to bear in mind with Greek land races is that they've had at least like, well, probably getting on for a century now of um, being used as a uh, bud rather than hash, because once the prohibition came in in the 19, late 1930s in uh, Greece, uh, really got enforced quite heavily. People had an incentive to use the plants as bud rather than hash. So yeah. once you've got that culture of using the plants as bud, you have a much stronger selective pressure for potency because you keep the seeds from the good stuff. Yep. So in general, they're more potent compared to Afghan land races. <clears throat> so that you know they're good they're good for that reason for western growers who are wanting to grow sensimilla and then plus they have an, another advantage which is they're very early finishing so oh, they nice. finish much earlier than afghan stuff so real oh, wow. afghan real afghan real hindu kush plants are not as early as people tend to assume like the reason we have all these early uh afghans is because people have selected it sure. for it like actually if you grow a field of real Afghan land races and a field of real Greek or Syrian or Lebanese, whatever land mm -hmm. races side by side in, you know, 40 degrees North, whatever the Greek stuff will be finished by late August, early September. Whereas the Afghans can be going right into late October, you know? Yeah. So, <clears throat> so um, they're, they're good for that as well. The Greek plants and they're really interesting. Like there's some indication that they may have more, complicated heritage than I've implied. You know, they, some of them could have been coming through the Balkans from Turkey and places to Greece. It's quite possible that there's a much earlier lineage than the um, the hash era. You know, I, when I talked about the bringing seeds, we thought that was the 1860s, 1880s kind of era. Whereas there's been Turkish... Um, uh influence cannabis wise in eastern europe you know going way back to the 15th century at least you know yeah because there's a big kind of um association between radical kind of sufi dervish type culture and cannabis that, that that goes way back to the ottoman era um you know and the turkish conquest of of istanbul and of, of constantinople whatever and yeah that um, Bektashis and the military units of the Ottoman Empire were very, very strongly associated with cannabis, and they were a feature in places like Albania going way back. You know, so I'm pretty sure there would have been cannabis grown back in in Eastern Europe, like Balkans bits of Eastern Europe, way back. But we just yeah. don't know much about it. And again, it's one of those things that the gen genomics can piece together. But if you look at Kalamata Red is one of these Greek That's strain the names. That I have. I yeah, so I, I don't know about the, that one. Is I don't know about how pristine that is necessarily, but on the sort of Phylos Galaxy, they didn't have anything else on their database that is very closely connected to it, mm -hmm. and um, that doesn't mean much necessarily because it's not a comprehensive sure sample of. The cannabis genome but um it's a yeah it's another curious one i suspect it's a more modern creation but we've got moliotico we've got one from crete we've got um, one from the um arcadian which is really from the real kind of 
like Molly Atico is from really from the real kind of historic hash producing areas of the 19th century. Um, yeah, I recommend people check them out, you know, like um, they're uh, much more suited to what most people are growing for. Yeah. Yeah. yeah they sound fascinating. Um, yeah. And of course, like, you know, we've talked a lot about the, the land race and, and heirloom type varieties, but um, you also have stuff like uh, some of the Dutch stuff that like the, the 90s Master Kush, the Afghan. Yeah. Uh, was that a Positronics one or a, a different one? Or oh, you know much about so, that? Like I made this decision way back to put that extra A in there because it's just how it's spelled in Dutch and that's how it's written on the yeah. packet. And, um it was designed to like emphasize that the Afghan 90 was like, just designed to emphasize that it's like a Dutch Afghan, you know, rather than, yeah, yeah. um, but, uh, yeah, so it's a whole bunch of material that like we, we got like in the, um, on like a trip to the, to, the, to Amsterdam in like late eighties, early nineties, like some of the people who I work with were over there in that era. I don't think it's positronic. It's like we just don't know. The thing to bear in mind is like in that time in the in Holland, you could just go and just buy like clones of the of someone on the street, you know? Yeah. Like literally, the people stand around at like festivals. Like I've got video of it on one the other site of like people just selling skunk cuttings like <laughs> on the street, and you could just go into the coffee shops and like a lot of the coffee shops back then were just like a fucking caravan or something. Like someone just parked up like a trailer and just opened a coffee shop and people That's were just funny. there who were like working um, on, you know, for some of the seed companies or had their own projects going and just selling these under, like under, I, I genuinely like, we, nobody can remember what the brand was that this was sold as, but it was like a very kind of low, low budget um, freelance selling guys you know selling this stuff just yeah. in his like homemade packs you know but yeah. they were all what was going around in like 89 90 <clears throat> so it's like master kush skunk special um we've got like a skunk haze all, all that stuff from that era like that you would see on the menus in in the like late 80s early 90s you know durban yeah durban yeah. uh skunk, skunk. Yes, all that. Yeah. yeah we've got like other stuff there was like a there's just like I know from having been there from as like I was like 92, 93, I guess would be my first, I'd have been like 15 or something first time I went there and uh, 14, 15, I can't remember. And, and, uh, and there was just like all the things you would see on the menu back then, you know, and yeah. some of them have been like branded, we tend to call them like cushies and stuff now, but you'd even see like Chitral, Chitrala, Chitrali, not Chitrali, oh, yeah. but like Chitrala. Or whatever. Yeah. yeah would be one of the ones you'd see. Yeah. So yeah. So you, you remember as well. Yeah. And it's like, there's just a certain staple of stuff and we've got like a pretty good representation of all of those. It's just a question of like how many of them we can get to germinate now out of yeah. the packs, you know? So some yeah. of them we'd have to, we've had to do as feminized just because we just didn't get males and stuff, you know, but yeah. still, like, you get, you've yeah, got sorry. feminized now, right? Like you've been working a lot yeah. more with feminized stuff. Uh, I just made a category for it because I was getting tired of people writing to me asking, like, have we got feminized seeds or do we yes, do feminized course. seeds? Yeah. And um, so I just made a, like a specific category for it. But some of it is just because some of them, like the pe freak show and things made just because mm -hmm. people want them feminized. And like the Dutch stuff, though, we've had to feminize them sometimes because we just didn't get any males. You know, you get like... yeah, yeah. A handful of these to pop and uh it's like what to, i think in future we'll make some regular ones based on whatever we can find that's as close as we can get to the uh like so for the durban we we did cross it with uh the nirvana durban skunk because it just seemed out of all of the ones available is actually truest to the original um uh stuff that was in Holland back then, you know? Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, you know, it's going to be interesting. Like, again, I'm, I'm going to try and get like genomics, proper hardcore genomics work done on all of those as well. Cause it could be quite a useful reference. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean the original Dutch stuff we've got from the nineties, because 
could be quite handy for like mapping everything out if they are. It's you know. super important to be like for, for any genomics database to have that stuff because yeah. it's, it is the backbone. Yeah. Essentially, yeah, what's left out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and again, like it would be good to actually really get that spelled out as clearly as possible for some of the younger folks involved because I just think so many people don't, so many people come into growing with this sense that like all these names correspond to some botanical reality when actually it's like probably, <laughs> right. probably there's about like 10 names <laughs> that actually yeah. have any meaningful basis. <laughs> uh, yeah. Especially as, as the Spanish got involved too with the uh, white labeling and <laughs> that, that, yeah. yeah, that changed everything. <laughs> yeah. And the thing, the thing is, I mean, I think the Spanish stuff is good because it, it is just good to have like as much diversity of different people doing stuff. Yep. But I get a little frustrated with the fact that so much of the ostensible land race stuff that's going around in Spain is just stuff that's been hit with like Northern Lights or Skunk yeah. or whatever. Um, I get that, you know, it's like, some people justify that in terms of meeting their customers halfway. It's like, come on, my customers aren't like nerds, you know, just mm -hmm. tell them it's like race, but it's like, yeah, kind of, but also, you know, there's an ecological issue going on here, which is like actually cannabis is like no exception in terms of the massive loss of biodiversity that's yep. probably going on. And, and certainly no, but it is going on in terms of what's cultivated and, um, uh, you know, it, it, I think you've got to actually take a bit of responsibility with educating your customer base. Absolutely. In terms of, like they, you can't expect them to, to spend hours digging through the literature and like just tell them straight up, this is actually something we've crossed, outcrossed yeah. Northern Lights and whatever. Um, that distinction is important, especially if it dominates it, you know. Yeah, well, I mean, there's a lot of it. A lot of it, though. Like, I've actually kind of actually had discussions with it with some of the Spanish guys, and they've been like, "Yeah, yeah, but we've taken it through like five generations since, and it's all like leans really heavily towards the original land race." So it's like, "Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, I mean, that's great, but still, just put it in the description." <laughs> yeah, like, how hard is that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They they they, yeah. they used to, but then they, like, there was, a, there was a point where suddenly like the land race became this really big thing, and they just like fucking cut it all out. It's like, guys, yeah. come on. <laughs> Uh, is there anything you wanted to highlight specifically that you've been working on lately or any of the the stuff that you've put up recently or anything yeah anything at all that you want to highlight um i mean the one of the really exciting things is that there will be some papers coming out studies coming out over the next sort of half a year to a year of like really seriously high quality genomics work and I, like i sent in all of the material I've got uh, to these projects and they will be producing like what should be the first really good quality like pan genome for cannabis like the whole species essentially that would be amazing and um, on the basis of that we'll have some like publicly um, uh, it'll all be publicly available data and and also some breeding tools based on that that you can basically send in you can you can you can use to really know like you can really start establishing genuine pedigrees and um this, this is the, ideally ideally you know what will be achieved yeah. and then the ultimate um, strain nerd shit yeah <laughs> yeah like essentially yeah so for just people who have just a and there's an end in itself, the, the strain nerd stuff, but also actually for the serious breeding work, you can use yeah, these absolutely. things as well. So you can really know what you've got and really start like uh, catching up on like the seven, eight lost decades <laughs> that cannabis yeah. has had in, in some respects compared to other crops. So um, yeah, um, there'll be some really good uh, uh, tools available to like people, you know, Basically, even even if you're, you know, you can have like kind of the equivalent. This is again, ideally, like equivalent level of quality of information about what you've got that like Mon fucking Monsanto has. Even if you're just like a, a a small business, you know, you can Absolutely. you can access 
access this stuff. So it's hopefully going to like level the playing field for for people who are involved in in uh, in uh, in cannabis breeding. You know, which is yeah. which was be nice given how money has made the playing field very not fucking level um, already. But um, I would definitely uh, say that that your company caters to breeders, which is uh, I, I wish more companies would. Like that's that's something that should be coveted, you know. To to have actual breeders wanting your stuff should, you know, I think that lends a yeah, lot of credibility. I, I mean, ideally that would be what it is. That the, the, there is there are so many barriers still, um, which are uh, which are which are in in the way in terms of to have the, you know, even even for like projects which have got like big money involved, it's classic kind of story is that a lot of germplasm i'm talking other crops now as well has just vanished yeah. over the years because there's just sheer economics of actually utilizing this material is really fucking challenging it's like if you've got uh, however many acres of land available to you to be growing on how much of that are you going to set aside to actually like work a land race absolutely it, you know and not just outcross and stuff Yep. Um, so, you know, uh, there are shortcuts now you can take like this kind of pre-breeding, you know, where you, where you try and kind of move the useful alleles from one land race into like an established cultivar yep. or from a feral population into an established cultivar. Like you try and basically take some handy traits like drought resistance or disease resistance, like powdery mildew resistance or like whatever a smell yeah. or whatever you're looking to like aroma you're looking for whatever you can shortcut you know from the land race to the cultivar so that's that kind of thing but it's very seldom you get anyone actually kind of just like inbreeding with one line to create an heirloom it's why we've got so few kind of actual genuine heirlooms now i mean as, as far yeah. as i know x18 and deep chunk as far as we know <laughs> are um genuinely kind of inbred from one land race yeah. Uh, again, it's going to take genomics to actually establish that. But the general consensus is I've never heard anyone like contesting that idea. But there aren't many like pure, genuine, pure uh, sativas around. You know, even haze is a, is a hybrid of yeah. uh, sativas. And then um, most of the sort of ostensible like Jamaican or African things going around, uh, like in Spain, have all been hit with something. I don't think yeah. many people can argue with that. I mean, you were asking about the Yunnan uh, line. Yeah, but, yeah. I mean, that's a skunk um, cross to something from kind of border borderlands of Yunnan. It's not a land race. Yeah. It's uh, and and um, there's no, uh, to the best of my knowledge, there's no historic kind of culture of growing cannabis as a drug in that bit of southern China. Yeah. Once you move across the border into the kind of Thai, like T A I, Shan, Thai Yai, Lao, Thai areas, sure, mm -hmm. you get a uh, there's a kind of ganja culture, but in Yunnan, Yunnan itself has no culture with these things. So you know, a lot of what's um, passed around is is anyway just hybridized stuff. I think that most of the notionally Burmese uh, lines in North America are, 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 are hybridized things. They don't the, the, yeah. the Burmese it doesn't look anything like the plants we've got from direct from Burma. You know? Yeah, there's a lot uh, of the Canadian. Uh, Burmese stuff that I've seen that looks just mostly Afghani. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, it's a, a broadleaf. Yeah, and there's no, there's no, there's no. Um, you don't just, you just don't get plants in places. Plants like that just do not naturally occur in the tropics. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, right. You're not in a monsoon area. <laughs> uh, just any tropical area. It's like there's so many reasons why it's not advantageous to have broad leaflets. Yeah, just get fucked up by the rain. And, yeah, yeah, and pathogens and broad leaflets are so much easier for insects to to to, to work on. Oh yeah, yeah. There's all kinds of reasons why you, you don't get that in the tropical population. Um, yeah. So so yeah, anyway, that's the most interesting thing I think is like hopefully next year is going to be really quite an exciting year in terms of the science of, of cannabis. Yeah. Um, and uh, making life much more um, easy for people who are doing reading 
projects. I'm, I'm excited about it. <laughs> I can't wait to see what you do with it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's not, it's not, it's just, it, it, it's not me doing the actual work. It's I've just submitted a whole bunch of. Uh, well, okay, I've done the work in terms of collecting these things, but I've just so, to don donated a bunch of material to some projects and um, see what they actually do in terms of making sense of it all. But as far as I understand, they've got like really, really super high quality, like long sequences. Yeah, of, that's of most important. Phylos didn't do that. They did the short. Yeah. Yeah. No, this is like mega long, like ultra high quality. And, uh, you know, because the problem with the genomics work to date, I mean, aside from some sort of ethical issues and stuff, sure. is that the reference genomes of that the, the people have been using a shit and, and they're all kinds of different read depths and mm -hmm. all kinds of incongruities between the data sets that just mean that you, if you, I've, I've, I know two groups, one mathematician and then another more kind of cannabis centric group who've done work on the existing data and just got these completely like back to front fucking results. You know, it's yeah. like if you, if you, this, this math guy's like, I, I'm just going through all this stuff. And, um, and he's like, uh, all the data saying that like the modern hybrids are like more diverse than the land races. And it's like, yeah, <laughs> man, that's, yeah. I, I don't, I, it's, uh, you know, it made the immediate reaction is like, well, that's fucking what fuck. And it's like, no, it's just this fucking data is a fucking mess, you know? Yeah. And, yeah. um, and, uh, cause you're looking like if you comparable kind of crops, uh, uh, just a, general point of comparison like if you look at other kind of land race comparisons to mm -hmm. modern material you're looking like at least like five times more diversity in the land races you know yeah and i, I would expect with cannabis once you factor in like really weedy populations it's way more fucking diversity in them compared to the modern stuff but again so much dodgy work or just you know limited quality work that's been done on 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 up to done to date so hopefully next year will be like uh, quite a big uh, leap forward in terms of making sense of all this stuff you know i truly hope um, so there's a lot of us that could use that yeah there's just like and there's so much so much to be clarified you know like just chatting with these groups as they're going these people as they're going through all the research it's like um, I think one of the first things of mine that they looked at was like uh, that Sudanese accession, mm -hmm. and they basically were just like, uh, "We're going to like basically have to rewrite our entire genome." Oh, <laughs> I don't think I don't know if it was. I think it was that one. It was just like, yeah, it's like the first one they looked at, and they're like, "Yeah, case okay, so is like, whoa, we just got like completely off the charts here." And then they looked at just even just the Milana and Parvati accessions and. Mm -hmm that's not even really like a pure land race. And they're like, yeah, we're finding whole new like uh, sex markers. I think it is for sex expression. Oh, wow. and kind of, yeah. Even found before. And then like crazy examples of like Monoisi in, in, in uh, the Southeast Asians and in the Afghan and in one of the Greek ones, they was finding this like um, X, Y, Monoisi. Like normally you find it mm -hmm. on the, Anyway, like males that were like genetically male showing mono EC and stuff, which is like, again, super interesting in terms that of uh, future breeding possibilities and stuff because mono -E stuff is a lot easier for many reasons to breed with and work with yeah. and stuff. And anyway, it's all kinds of possibilities and it's like so much uh, catching up to be done uh, with such an important crop that's just been held back massively um and uh yeah it should be really interesting um, yeah that sounds fascinating just, yeah so i yeah. have i have a few questions i want to uh, go through just from our, our discord that people wanted to ask i try to go for the best ones because there's quite a few um let's see Ooh. yeah so most of these uh questions we've actually covered as a course of just conversing um, yeah, there's one, I mean, like almost all of them we covered <laughs> just by conversing, right. but one, one that I think will be probably the most asked question you'd probably, when you get a lot is from a hmm. CCC and he asked how to keep pure, well, pure, relatively pure, uh, sativa is manageable indoors. Do you have any advice on that? Um, 
I mean, one of the main um, tricks people do that I'm aware of is um, uh, you can use pot size to just control and 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 like because uh, if it's really like a pure straight from a farmer type sativa, it's it's they're going to keep rooting even during flowering, you know. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> you can just pot up in the kind of second week of flower or so still, and you should find that the it will still root into the new compost. Uh, which can be good as well because it can mean that you don't make the mistake of like overfeeding too much during flower. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> and the other thing uh, with sativas indoors is to try to not overwater them. Like it's a really important aspect of of traditional farming of of ganja, you know, since me or whatever, is uh, the right irrigation schedule. So m even these days. Um, the good quality uh, production in places like Laos and stuff is in areas where they've got access to lakes or ponds or streams to irrigate yeah. on schedule rather than just allowing rain fed um, yeah. you know, uh, to dictate it. Rain. Yeah, so in other words, the, the main good quality crop is done from sort of sowing in mid-August-ish and then harvesting kind of feb February ish. So you, um, uh, September ish or whatever to, to February, March ish, basically six months over the starting at the end of monsoon. So you can have a bit of rain whilst the plants are in veg, but really once you're into flower, you're looking to like have zero rain ideally and yeah. just have you know, irrigation. And the mistake people make indoors is to overwater. So we've already kind of touched on that. But um, the other thing is you can, if they're a real land race, you can prune back pretty fucking heavily if, if you want. And you can, you can, you can um, concentrate the uh, bud production into the, exactly where you want if you pr prune carefully. And you can prune like quite late on in the cycle of growth still. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, uh, I can't think of other things. To be honest with you, I'm not like an expert grower. I just know from talking to people and, and stuff. Yeah, like, for sure. I, I, I don't have like a huge amount of opportunities to grow because of the amount of moving around I do, you know? Yeah, yeah um, you can imagine. That makes it yeah. hard. I, um, anyway, I, yeah. It's, uh, but yes, yeah, so, sativas, they're not well adapted to in, indoors, basically, is the bottom, <laughs> bottom yeah, line. Yeah, you know? the bottom line, for they sure. They really want to be outside. And, they will, um, <clears throat> you know, the, the the type of land they want to be on is a, is a really important consideration. So in the big ganja growing areas of India um, in the late 19th, 30th, 20th century, there was quite a good documentation done of that whole economy because it was economically very significant. Um, <clears throat> and um, the land along the rivers, along the Ganges Delta area that was very loamy, like light sandy loams yeah that don't hold water too much but are very nutrient rich were really sought after by uh, people who wanted to, to to get into commercial production you know yeah and um there were techniques which are still used of, of how you prepare the land <clears throat> so you know still they'll do this still in in southeast asia as you um create um uh, uh, ridges you know like a raised raised beds, like a kind of semi um, circle type shape with runs between them for the water, and then you plant on top of those um, half circles, as it were. You know what I mean? So yeah. uh, cur curved the uh, raised bed, and uh, so that means that you, the water runs off the roots. <clears throat> so it, the the thing you're just trying to avoid is for the to have the roots sitting in waterlogged um, waterlogged uh, land because that yeah. Cannabis just does not fucking like that, and it will get it will get infected, and there are all kinds of parasites and pathogens that were already very well known back in the in that time, <clears throat> which are even cannabis specific forms of powdery mildew and stuff, you know. Um, and um, you know I, <laughs> these conversations sometimes with people who are like using these 
um, what is it, nat natural um, sort of, uh, what is it, some kind of like people basically growing in this like composting compost that's not even properly uh, composted. Like Korean natural farming stuff? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I get these kind of emails from people sometimes and I like I try and like be as nice as I can. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's tough. I'm like, I'm like <laughs> On principle, I'm like all for kind of permaculture and anything like sure. that. It's like, but Jesus, man, like cannabis does not want to be in that kind of fucking situation. Yeah. This guy I, writing yeah, to I, me like, yeah, yeah I, 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 I've created this amazing system where like the soil is wet 24 seven. <laughs> it's like, yeah. man, I love that. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> no cannabis wants to be like, they, I mean, okay, I, with hydroponics and stuff, maybe they've, I mean, I, I think in over the last 50, 60 years, like cannabis in the West has adapted to all kinds of maltreatment, but sure, absolutely ultimately, has. Um, ultimately, yeah, you don't want to be growing a land race in like soggy, <laughs> yeah. incredibly rich compost. Yeah, that makes especially sense. Not, like, com especially not with like stuff li literally rotting on the surface. <laughs> yeah. So this yeah. guy's like, I said, can you send me like a photo? And he says, you're seeing this like fucking cooch grass, like growing in, <laughs> in the same yeah. pot. They do, that. they do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, each their own, I guess, but yeah. yeah. God so bless them. <laughs> if someone's asking my opinion, I, I feel I should just tell them like, no. <laughs> yeah. Just don't grow this type. <laughs> It'll take abuse. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, anyway. Is there any strange you want to highlight that you currently have for sale right now, or any anything uh, else you want to talk about and get in? I mean, I'm really interested. Like, uh, and you can, um, I we collected a bunch of stuff from Arissa, which is sort of just south of of Bengal. Okay, uh, which I suspect is um, uh, quite um, historically significant um, in terms of the development of um of sativas like real tropical sensimilar land races yeah. uh you know we were talking about there's that um book the uh, or kind of uh alchemical it's an alchemical book actually the iron and the kanda is the name of it um mm -hmm. where they describe the sensimilar technique that's from around there kind of andhra pradesh uh barissa area <clears throat> was where that was probably compiled and um i suspect those plants are pretty interesting uh to look at uh they seem to be yeah. like probably more like five months from seed to harvest uh the ones we've got and um also um yeah and and then um I'm planning to have some nepali um uh ganja land races available soon as well which i think will be pretty interesting i mean yeah. just in terms of product stuff like i'm a big fan of the southeast asians but the because of the aromas and stuff and i think there's been a lot of hybridity between possibly like independent centers of domestication south of yunnan with the the east indian uh centers of domestication I, I don't know this is just a hunch but um anyway i think these uh actual south asian land races like from arissa and andhra pradesh and um, the Terai regions of Nepal are, are worth checking out. So we've got already uh, some, like Dakshin Kali is the name of the one from Nepal that we've got that's <clears throat> kind of, uh, uh, you could say, like being domesticated. It definitely has been domesticated for use as bud, not just as hash. Yeah. And then the original one is very much specifically for bud. And um, both of them I think will be really interesting to look at. Uh, really nice aromas from them too as well you know yeah um, and types of effect are really good like very stimulating and positive um, it sounds freaking awesome <laughs> to be honest yeah yeah i'm quite keen to see what the genomics work discovers about them because my hunch is they're probably that uh east india and nepal and east india are kind of where the sativas really originate first We'll see. Yeah. yeah, that's so fascinating. I can't wait to see that all work out. Um, where where should people go to buy your seeds? Uh, what's the website? 
um, therealseedcompany.com, and then for the for the modern stuff is quickseeds.com. It's a stupid name, but it's like what I I'd, I'd originally K-W-I-K. planned. It. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'd originally planned it as like a budget thing. I was just going to buy a bunch of like cheapo Dutch seeds and sell it on there, yeah. and I'm like, oh, fuck it. I just don't want to get into the, like big business stuff, and so it's kind yeah. of just at speed. But um, yeah, that's where we, for the time being, anyway, all the all the kind of really interesting '90s material we've got, and some other um, that's like some later '90s things like uh, Cinderella '99, Amnesia, yep. uh, which are really good, very strong as well. If you're looking for like strong, uh, really strong stuff, and then some Colombian. Um, um, uh, like a Colombian import that's probably like a Northern Lights crossed with a Colombian land race, then crossed with some like um, um, uh, heirloom Colombian and Mexican things, all kinds of things yeah. like that you can find there. And a whole bunch of just like kind of fun hybrids with things like uh, Pakistan Trichal Kush crossed with like some land races, which would be great, like for just making hash and stuff and all for oh, bud, absolutely. you know, yeah. And, and very, uh, nice prices for most of it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just, oh um, yeah. Fun stuff to play with if you've got the space and things. Any, yeah. any way, uh, you'd prefer to be contacted to if people want to reach out to you? Yeah, sure. I, I generally, um, if you want a quick response, like, uh, the um gmail real seed coat at gmail is best uh, you can contact me on instagram as well but i sometimes i'm not on there like i i, I may not get back to you as quickly and i sometimes yeah. miss the um miss the uh incoming messages you know yeah. like i yeah. forget to check the request a bit sometimes so yeah always I to, 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 to use this use the site contact form or, or just email me directly and, and and that i should get back to you within like two to three days max you know awesome well i gotta say i'd love to have you back sometime when uh time allows for you it's been an absolute pleasure yeah i I, and and and, um i've really enjoyed it and it's very kind of you to give me the space to just ramble i I, i'm slightly fucking burned out and a bit like uh sleep deprived always seems to be when i do these podcasts but um (laughs) maybe when i'm back in the uk we can do another one at a more civilized well, it's kind of a civilized hour now, but I'm just not a civilized person, so I've not been, <laughs> I've been getting out of bed before. Like, anyway, but uh, yeah. So anyway, it's been it's been good though. Yeah, thanks, man. I've enjoyed it. I, I, I appreciate your time, my friend, and um, I'll talk to you soon. This is going to air Friday, and uh, yeah, nice. people are going to be stoked. People are really going to dig it. I'll probably cut it into two or three parts. Yeah, yeah, nice one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow, oh, great. Cool. I'll keep you posted on it. And, and again, thank you for your time. And um, yeah, it's an honor. I really appreciate yeah, it. Thank you. Yeah. No question. All right, brother. I'll talk to you soon. Yeah, cool. So as, as that, that's um, that's that is it. Like, uh, yeah, it's a wrap. Yeah. And send me the um, everything over, like, and I'll as soon as you've got it all going. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And, it, so and it, it'll premiere on, live, and there'll be people in chat. There's usually over 100 something people that'll watch it live. Oh, yeah, nice! It gets a few thousand views in the first two days. Awesome. Yeah. yeah, yeah, nice. Yeah, no, that's okay. Yeah, yeah just uh, and and so it will go on YouTube and everything. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll put it on the site as well, and, and that'll be great. I appreciate yeah. that. Nice one. All right, my friend. Right. Thank you so much, and thank you. Like seriously, thank you for your time. I know it's hard to. No, no, it. it's a pleasure. No, I can. I like. I can talk at length about this whenever. So I it's. Love uh, it. Yeah, it's uh, always, it, always I appreciate it. Nice one, man. Well, have a have a lovely evening, and and I hope it's a bit more chill than I've been over the last few weeks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that sounds We're finally in a too. smooth spot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, enjoy, enjoy. All right, All right my friend. I'll talk to you soon. Yeah. Nice one. Cheers. Cool. Bye bye. Want more syndicate? check out our Patreon in the description below. Thank you for joining us on this journey. We are forever thankful that enough people watch us to keep us going. With that in mind, you can show your support for the show by liking, subscribing, and sharing the show. We don't advertise, so we need you. Also hit riotseeds.com and syndicategear.com to show more support for the show. Kick over the statues and bring it back to the farmers.